the, for those of you who aren't familiar with the intricacies of the Eurozone world, um, at the end of 2011, a chap called Lord Wolfson, who was chairman of Next, um, launched, a, 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 I think, a very thoughtful essay prize. Um, and the, the, the topic which he asked the contestants to address was, if a Eurozone country leaves the Eurozone, how best should Europe manage that process? And that allowed us to, 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 to cut through the Gordian knot, which until then you couldn't really discuss a country leaving because it's verboten. It's a terrible thing to think about because it might be circular and you might roll into the thing leaving and so on. So he allowed academics and practitioners to just think about that. Um, he also did something very um, uh, helpful in, 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 in getting academics and city economists to think about it by offering a first prize of £250,000. And it's not often you get an essay prize, and it was only 25,000 words, where you get £250,000 as the first prize. So not surprisingly, there were 420 entries for this uh, uh, essay prize. And five were shortlisted, and mine was one of them. Um, but I, and I didn't win, um, uh, mine was the most radical of all the, uh, of all the proposals. Um, and my proposal was that I if it became inevitable that a country had to leave, then Merkel, who would have previously planned and orchestrated a full-scale exit, would call everyone together the whole of the, of the 17 nations in the Eurozone and require that they all left with one announcement on one day at the same time. Now, so you can work out from that that I come from a fairly sceptical perspective <laughs> about the Eurozone and I happen to believe, particularly with the things that have happened in the last, uh, l the last nine months, that we will end up with a Eurozone exit. Uh, we will probably end up in one way or another with the demise of the Eurozone. Um, and my own view is the proposal I've made is the best still. And, uh, you know, you can ask me questions about that as we go through it. I'm not going to talk about that here. I'm talking about what's going on at the moment. But I, just to give you a bit of a flavour from where I come from. I should say I've been writing about this for 15, 15 more, nearly 20 years. So I was writing about how sceptical I was about the Eurozone prior to its, its advent. And because my, my day job is managing currency risk, this has been reasonably high up my agenda and obviously of my clients as well who are international investors. So my, my, my question is this. Um, when you read about the Eurozone, you think, you think Greece, you think Italy, you think Spain, and what you think is they've been profligate. They've all spent too much, the government just raised money and spent it and it raised debt and it was easy to raise debt and it was all, you know, it was all about profligacy. So that's the conventional wisdom. And when you, when you read the papers, if I ask the man in the street what went wrong in Greece, he'd say they spent too much and they had too much debt. Um, the proposals at the moment um, are about controlling the business of spending and raising debt. So we keep the euro. The, the proposals I'm saying are this is official policy. We keep the euro. We have a, a euro-wide banking union, whatever that means, and I think nobody knows what that means. It's not just common regulator, it's something to do with a common guarantor, and I, in my opinion that's just not going to happen. Um, and we have got a thing called ESM, European Stability Mechanism, which is currently a euro-wide guarantee of sovereign, of sovereign borrowing, but it's not very large, it's about, about 400 billion euros, which in Euro world is, uh, uh, is, not, um, uh, is not large. And, uh, th and then I put at the bottom, and most controversially, and you can't read what I've said, well, what I said is stiff fiscal targets for delinquent countries. So when we, there was a, a, a conversation at lunchtime about austerity in the UK. We know nothing about austerity if you think about Greece. So a country like Greece, and indeed in Spain and Italy, has, have serious contractions in public spending. And that is sanctioned at the top, at the centre, in Strasbourg and in Brussels, and essentially in, 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 in I was going to say in Bonn, in Berlin, that's old money. Um, the, the, the official view is you spend too much in the public sector, you've got to stop spending, and that's the way out of this problem. So, um, has it worked in Ireland? Um, has what worked? 
this austerity? Well, it depends what you mean by work. Certainly they have um, restored what you might say was um, somewhat their financial and fiscal credibility. Um, they have reduced their external deficit to zero, so their, their trade balance is now, is now positive. I think their fiscal balance is pretty much neutral. Um, but they've now got a very large public sector debt and um, very high unemployment. But of course they can export their unemployment to the UK, particularly where you have a high lot of... So, you know, in a way Ireland's a sideshow. It, it took one particular route, I would say in a reasonably determined way, in the context of the Eurozone fairly successfully. But would you want to be Irish at the moment? Mm, it's not fun, believe you me. It's not very nice. You'd probably be over here in London looking for a job. Um, so, so I'm going to I'm going to challenge the the proposition that it's about it's about borrowing too much, right? public spending and borrowing too much. So, um, is the South over borrowed? Is the eurozone over borrowed? Um, and, and the answer is uh, yes. It's true. Most of the uh, of the southern European states over borrowed. Uh, one in particular. Greece behaved like a sort of kleptocracy. I mean, it, it lied and cheated its way into the euro. It lied to uh, uh, the European Commission and the ECB about its fiscal position. It doesn't really have a, a tax collection system, which we would recognise as a tax collection system. Um, but it's, it's a loan. It, it's not a systemic problem within the euro. It, it, it's, it's a Greek problem. That, that, you know, n no one else has behaved like that. So you've got to really put them slightly on one side. Um, uh, Ireland and Spain, funnily enough, did not run particularly uh, uh, large public sector deficits, but they got caught up in a property, a property a, a boom which the banks financed, and then the banks went under, and as, as, as a result of that, rather like Japan, Ireland and Spain had to refinance, the state had to refinance their own bankrupt banks, and in Ireland's case, its, its, uh, its public debt to GDP ratio rocketed. In Spain's case, it's rocketing, but it hasn't got there yet. Um, but generally speaking, and I'm sorry, this is all right at the bottom, and I'm, I've got this, this crib here, but generally speaking, the behaviour, if you look at the uh, accumulated outstanding public sector debt as a percentage of GDP of the Eurozone states, it doesn't look particularly weird. What you've got is 1999-2012, um, essentially, and this is debt to GDP ratio, that's 120, that's naught, my, my finger's on 60. So essentially, the median borrower between 1999 and 2008 didn't increase their debt to GDP ratio. You know, you're not looking at a graph that's just sliding upwards all the time. You're not looking at what seems to be fiscal incontinence. Now, what you've got here, this is 2008, is pretty much everyone goes up. But to be honest, pretty much everyone has gone up outside the Eurozone as well. And in fact, this is my coup de grace, is my next slide here, you can't see but along here, I'll run, I'll try to, this is the UK. We run along here pretty much flat. Here, 2008, we were running at 43% of GDP. We run up here, we're at just, we're at 90% of GDP. We're the black line. We actually look like the median Eurozone um, country. That's Greek default, which reduced, um, in fact, it, re it, it, it was about, 40% um, of Greek GDP was defaulted on. It was called restructuring, but let's make no bones, it's a default. Uh, but because they are, are borrowing at such a scale, um, the amount by which the Greek debt has gone down is not that much. And you get a flavour of the good guys. You know, Estonia, actually, they're a very late entry. They only joined in 2010 or 11, I think, very, very late. Uh, Luxembourg's always been very low. But everyone else, you can, you can see, you know, 
reasonably what, what I was saying is it's flat here, it goes up here, but hey, that's the automatic stabilizers. That is what you would expect in a modern Western economy when you have a horrible recession. Um, the very interesting, horrible one here is Ireland. It was here, it was very low, it didn't have a profligate government at all, but it did have a horrible property boon, and it guaranteed, if you remember, all its depositors and therefore all its banks, and it went from there up to there, which is 120% of GDP, so that, that is quite painful. And now you'll see clearly, as I move to here, without touching, I think that's the UK. So, it, it, you know, it's not the Eurozone. The Eurozone has not had its troubles from fiscal incontinence. It, they, the, 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 the fiscal behaviour of, with the exception of Greece, fiscal behaviour looks reasonably normal. Um, so, I mean, I'm summarising what I've just said. So what makes this, um, this crisis, the Eurozone crisis, so intractable? And it is genuinely intractable. And this graph is the one, remember that one is essentially flat and goes up at the crisis. But look at this graph. That is not flat, that is continuous divergence from day one. And I'll tell you what it is, just so you know. Along the, at the bottom is the, is the period since the beginning of the Eurozone, so that's 99 to 2012. Um, each of the curves is, as it says, the cumulative external current account balance, balances as a percentage of GDP, this is the cumulative external trade balances for each country with the rest of the world. I have to say most of them trade very largely with the Eurozone. But it shows that you have Greece and Portugal running consistent trade deficits, external deficit, which I've accumulated, it's the accumulated one, which means that in the 12 or 13 years since the start of the Eurozone, they have, a, they have imported 120% of GDP more than they've exported and they will have borrowed that money externally you have to do that you can only import more than you export if you borrow money and vice versa you have the netherlands finland and germany which is the top three there who have exported the numbers are smaller it's it's uh, netherlands is at 80 percent of gdp germany is at 45 50 percent of gdp because these are huge economies in comparison with the ones in the south the numbers will actually pretty much add to zero in fact they'll add to slightly positive because the Eurozone as a whole has a slight external surplus, a, a trade surplus, not a deficit. But this is a very different shape of graph. This isn't a graph which is, oh, it's fine until 2008 and then it, could, and, and then it diverged. It's diverging from day one. Because the Eurozone is a single currency, all the automatic stabiliser, the feedback loops that mean that when you get a country running a balance of payments deficit for a period, it starts to have, you know, a weaker currency, it can't raise money, blah, blah, blah. and then it, you know, essentially it gains competitiveness by, by, by losing its terms of trade. Argentina, we talked about, I think, in a, a, a couple of talks earlier, is a classic, and then it has an export boom, and it pulls around, yes. So, if you're putting the cause and effect on the start of the Eurozone as a economic community, so what did this graph look like if you extended it back to Oh, this isn't, this isn't cause and effect. Okay. This, this, is, this is the political, I mean, we, look, Germany's been an exporting powerhouse since the end of the right, Second I World War. It, it's been, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, no, that's absolutely true, but the point is Germany can't go on doing that forever. And, you know, that it was rather less stable. A lot of these had previously had surplus and deficit because they had a whole lot of crisis. We had the French franc, a good example. You know, it was running deficits on a regular basis. It spent too much. It then had franc, franc crisis, franc crisis, which made it more competitive. Italy, much, Italy actually even more so. Italy, which has been quite an exporting powerhouse. Italy is actually quite a good example of where things started initially okay, because they probably went in at a reasonable exchange rate, but they've had a, a significantly higher level of inflation, which has begun to pull them down. And actually, that's been a big problem for them, because they do have, particularly northern Italy, is, is, is very strong on price-sensitive exports, like manufacturers and fashion, leather, and things like that, sorry, manufacturers, engineering, um, engineering goods. So, so yes, there's a lot of preconditions. A lot of these are structurally um, kind of investing, sorry, saving economies like, like Germany, a lot are spending uh, like the southern economies. But the stabilizers and the great thing about markets is, uh, is we don't have to worry about that. We let markets sort it out. If you borrow too much, markets don't like it, they will, they will send your currency down and then you will adjust and if they don't want to lend to you you can't borrow and you can't import more than export so the great thing is you don't need politicians 
you just walk away you you don't you just you just let it happen um, and we 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 have had what we have here is a security blanket which we've thrown over the whole lot and we've said we we don't care about this these 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 don't matter and just to give you a flavor of the numbers here I a great effort actually I found a couple of series of actually it's goods and services but not it but not um, uh, uh, income and dividends but uh, the trade balance not the full balance of payments of Germany with the rest of the Eurozone so this actually is the exact number we're talking about and I've just accumulated the two series exports minus imports accumulated from uh, Jan 99 until Jan 2013 so this which is now 1.1 trillion euros is what the Germans have sold to their neighbours essentially down south and lent them the money to do that it has to be that way around because who else is going to because this is within the eurozone this isn't about outside so it's um it, it's it's trade credit or vendor finance i think you like see so you sell your car to a guy who hasn't got any money and you give him the finance and he uses the car and then you say can you pay the interest and the capital he says well i haven't really got any so that's where we are and that's i think is to me this is the fundamental issue this is forget the politics which is you know uh, uh, overwhelming in this debate the reason we have flexible exchange rates and the, the reason that Bretton Woods which was started in 46 47 and and crashed in ignominy in 72 3 is it couldn't cope with the the dynamism of the world economy when you get changes in terms of trade when you get changes in particularly things like oil and so on it can't cope if you have these rigidities and you know if we had perfectly flexible internal markets so we could reduce a chap's wages by 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 you know 20 percent fine which is what we did on a gold standard you just say you're, you're paid left and he couldn't go to the industrial tribunal and say he fired me he just says oh, okay well that's what happens so exchange rates are the are the uh, the, are the equilibrating mechanism and they've gone um, so how does that work? I mean, I said they'd lent all this money, but are they really going to lend money to all these guys to keep... And remember, that's still going up. It's not turned down yet, even though the Eurozone is a ho in a horrible recession. So we just haven't got the stabilisers. So, easy. Until 07, the private sector. And it, you know, private sector is very, very simple. You're a German investor, and, and I don't necessarily mean a, an individual. This is this is institutional and you have a range of bonds and instruments to invest in and you get a one or two percent premium for investing in Spain with no currency risk and e even in the government you think well it's no problem it's all ECB guaranteed in effect I'll have some of that until you realized in 07 08 that there was a non-zero chance that these weaker countries might default on their obligations and you start to look at the countries and think well they actually can't sustain this so then literally there was a there was a drawing of, of, of a line in the sand and all pu all private financing stopped so for these countries and you and you could see that in the south you know that they had, had no funding and their cost of funding rocketed so the what what happened to to allow this to continue and indeed to allow them to stay in the eurozone was that the public sector stepped in and said we will do the recycling don't worry mr private sector we will do it and the way the mechanics of how it works is Germans keep on saving remember they're exporting more than they're importing so they're saving money all the time and they put it in the bank and the bank instead of now lending it to you know German business sticks it with the ECB in secure liquid deposits with the ECB it's got cash in the bank at hand which is what all the banks have done because they're so worried the ECB then recycles that money typically by providing finance to the banks in the south by providing them with funding and those banks then go and buy sovereign debt I mean it is QE but it's sort of intra-regional QE actually the ECB is it's illegal for them to have monetary financing of uh, uh, of government of government debt that's, that, that's part of the constitution of the ECB so they found these ways round. so all these three letter acronyms E sorry one's for EFSF ESM and ELA are all instruments and funds by which in effect money is circulated from the north that's being saved to the south where it's being lent and there's even a default thing which I'll talk about in a minute called target two balances which is actually what's left over when you cut even with all those 
systems um, which actually have criteria so when you lend money to the South they had to, had to post collateral they ran out of collateral what's left and target two is what's left because in the end if this system is to work if you write a cheque on an extant uh, a bank in Spain which is operating as a bank in Spain for 500,000 euros to buy wh whatever you're buying that has to be cashable and fungible across the eurozone you can't have the Bundesbank saying, I'm sorry, I'm not taking this because it's written in Spain. You have to, if it's going to be a monetary union, you have to have it fungible, and Target 2 allows that. Um, so I think I've des described um, what happened. What I haven't described is the scale, is that the ECB, which is actually an incredibly thinly capitalised bank, talk about, you know, all the politicians are saying, uh, you know, these banks that lent too much, they had no capital. The ECB has 10 billion of capital. That's it. Its balance sheet is 2.6 trillion. I mean, the, 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 the ratio is so small it's non-existent. But of course, behind it is a sort of implication that is guaranteed. The ECB is guaranteed by each of its member states. And I would say, I'd say, dream on. No way. There's no way with a scale like that. That's 28% of eurozone GDP and 100% of German GDP. So forget the Germans underwriting the ECB. They're not doing it. They might underwrite their share of the ECB, which happens bizarrely to be 28% of the ECB. That they own 28% of the ECB. They'll probably pick up 28% of any liabilities that there are, but they won't pick up anything else. So I think you've got at the centre of this a very vulnerable institution in the way that the Fed and the Bank of England are not vulnerable because the Bank of England is the UK state and the Fed is the US state and they will not default they might inflate their way out but they won't default but the ECB although you think it can print money it can only print money if it has a state behind it and if the whole thing falls to pieces or a major state says not doing it and we got we're getting very very close to that very very close look at Greece look at Cyprus then you have something which is very dangerous anyway the moment uh, what happens is what I described the Germans put money on deposit you relaying that put another one MRLO and LTRO these are all mechanisms by which liquidity is funneled into all the bankrupt banks in the south and they finance public deficits and public deficits pick up the lost demand uh, with, with the, the one that you lose when you have net negative export demand. Um, so that's the graph of ECB assets, you know, you, you get the familiar thing, it sort of looked vaguely okay here, although there's obviously a little bit of stress here we didn't pick up. This is, that's, that's, the, that's the total assets of the ECB graph, and remember assets equals liabilities, so that's the total liabilities as well, they don't actually own any money. Um, and it, it's come back a little bit, it's come back um, after uh, uh, Mario Draghi, the, uh, the new uh, the president of the ECB, said they will defend um, the euro with whatever it takes. And, and frankly, that was an absolute classic. You know, he, he, he's, he, he's like the, um, the, 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 the wizard in The Wizard of Oz. I mean, he hasn't got anything. Merkel's got something. Merkel's got the massive German economy. But he has nothing. But he, he just, he's just said that because he thought he would. Yeah. And it kind of... And of course... Uh, I mean, banking is about confidence. If people believe your bank's OK, then they don't take the money out, then it is OK. If they believe it's not, they take the money out, and every single bank in the world is illiquid because no bank owns 100% liquid securities. They lend it to businesses. And it's the same with the ECB. Um, he said it was, it was going to be OK. They defend the euro. People said, oh, OK, they're going to defend the euro. And obviously got Merkel to agree to that. So, in fact, the, the extent of the recycling they've had to do into the South has eased a bit because the private sector has picked up. Because the private sector, let's say private sector, think of a pension fund. It says, I've got German bonds, they're paying me just under 1% a year. But I can now buy a Spanish bond, and I don't think the Spanish are going to go under. No currency risk. And I get 4% a year. And believe me, I've got a horrible deficit, and I need that. You know, I'm looking for, for returns, so I'll take a bit of that. And next time they look, it's 3.5% yield, and they've made a 10% gain on their bond. So they buy some more. <coughs> so we're back to, this is the good time. And it was all the bad times before that. And so, you know, it's just, there's a little bit going on which allowed the things you know to survive and this thing I mentioned called target 2 target 2 is so esoteric it's quite hard to even understand but it means that essentially whenever you write a check in the south there's a, a, a mechanical process of it, it, it going up to the bank you write it on and then that going up to a netting arrangement at the ECB which clears the funds that then goes up to if it's been written in the south on a, uh, uh, on, a, on a creditor in the north, um, which clears the funds at the ECB and, the, and, then, and then goes up to the bank in the north 
um, uh, and pays the um, uh, you know the exporter. Um, it was it's a, it's like it's a clearance. It's like Fed funds. It's a, it's a clearing system, but it stopped clearing, and no one really spotted this. It stopped clearing because there weren't any 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 natural flows coming the other way. We 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 knew that from the end of two thousand and seven, we didn't read private finance, but all those ELAs and ELTOs all had rules attached, and the central banks didn't have enough collateral, so they wrote the checks and just ran it on overdraft, and they said, "Will the ECB said, okay, you can owe us the money." And they said to the Germans, OK, we'll owe you the money. And it was an ECB obligation. It was, it was an uncleared, effectively uncleared effect. And they even put an interest rate on it. The interest rate is the standard ECB interest rate, which is about half a percent. And Target 2, which you think that's very esoteric, went crazy. So I've, I've given you a couple of the Target 2. These, these, these are the balances of the central bank uh, of the countries I've marked, which is on the top is Germany, on the bottom is the combination, the addition of Italy, Spain and Greece, um, their balance is with the ECB. So it's what they own, the blue one, or what they owe. So again, it's eased a bit with, with the draggy and the, sort of the slight taking off of the pressure, but look at the scale of it. That's un forget those other numbers I showed you. In addition, there's another 600 100 billion euros that's owed by the ECB to Germany and is and 600 and something which is owed, owed by a combination of Italy, Spain and Greece to the ECB and this is a specifically an obligation ECB is in the middle of this um, and what happened is very interesting that, 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 that no one really knew about this at all and in the beginning of 2000 or about here when it was about 500 a German MP discovered this because no one had reported this it nets off at the ECB so it doesn't come out in an ECB report a German MP discovered that the ECB owed Germany half a trillion euros and he went ballistic and he stood up in Parliament and said, what the hell is going on? We have to put in a law that says stop. And then a person from the Treasury took him aside and said, we can't stop it because if you stop it, then the next cheque that's written in Spain will bounce. And if it bounces, it's the end of the Eurozone. He went, oh shit, so what do we do? And they didn't know what to do, so it just kept on rising. So, I mean, it really is, we are so strained, we are so stressed in the Eurozone, we have no idea in the UK. Because everything clears, essentially, when you write a cheque in sterling, it's clearing. The exchange rate with the pound against the dollar, 150 something, and the pound, they're all even numbers of buyers and sellers, no official people involved. You know, and even today, although we've got some very weird things going on in QE, I don't worry about QE in the sense of, of the solvency of the UK because the Bank of England and the government are the same people and whether we like it or not in the end we'll raise taxes and we'll pay or inflate our way out yeah so if you did the same graph in the United States for certain states against other states you'd see the same thing I think where basically some states put in a lot more than they get back and other states take a lot more than they put in but as a whole that system works really well and other than Texas no one no state really says they want to leave so why I would be surprised if you had numbers of this scale. Remember, probably not that big. I, I mean, you know, this. No, in, in, in the states, they they um, have to settle these, so they have to clear it with assets. So I, I think it's every day. I, I, I think you'll find you don't get these balances. You do get other imbalances. That is true. But of course, in the states, and this is the difference really between the states and the eurozone. It's well. It's one, de well come to this, it's one democracy, it's one monetary policy, you've got almost perfect mobility of labour, you've certainly got perfect mobility of qualifications, language, data, culture, all of those things. You know, it looks like a country, I know it's a big country and I know it's very regionally, economically diverse, but the clearing mechanisms are not just price, they're all sorts of other things, you know, I'll go and live in Al Alabama because the tax is a bit low or whatever. No, no, they actually clear it. So and, and well, these will be cleared, yeah, yeah but, I'm talking about, but I'm talking about all the other mechanisms to yeah. keep, when you have very regional, big regional, regional differences yeah. in but with one currency, how else do you do it? Well, there's a lot of other mechanisms that, 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 that make it work and, and, you know, I'm absolutely convinced at a, certainly at a hundred year horizon we'll have the dollar covering the dollar zone. So that's target two. So, yeah. What if Scotland leaves the UK? What's your oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's a very good question because you will get exactly the, 
the same failures of clearing as we're seeing now. Now I don't know which way they'll go or how it'll, how it'll pan out or whether they get North Sea oil or gas or, 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 or what liabilities they get, you just don't know. The point is that politicians shouldn't have to think about all this because it's complex and it's dynamic. And we think, oh, the Scots are useless, but they may not be. But, and, and we may not know, you know, the exchange rate would go in, I'm sure, at one for one, you know, so they'd have the Scottish pound, they wouldn't, you know, move their prices. Well, well, no, if they kept the pound, they don't automatically adjust their, um, uh, their wages by reducing all, all the salaries by 20%, which is probably the competitive level. You know, they say, well, we'll, we'll stick with the pound. So they start at the wrong rate, pr pr probably. They stop getting a transfer from the UK because they're currently getting public sector transfer from the UK, and stuff would happen. Probably very like the stuff that happens between, I don't know, the Eurozone and Ireland. I mean, who knows? But, but I'm, I, think, I think the UK is quite right to say, whoa, 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 we can't just say you can have the pound. It's a big issue. And it, it will become, I think, an enormous issue in this. Yes, sorry. Um, Germany presumably has benefited hugely from, ha from having a weak euro. I mean, obviously in Switzerland, but Mark's very strong and the Swiss are very concerned about that. Good, good question. Um, well, I'd say it's a double edged sword that Germany has had good, consistent economic growth, particularly <coughs> export growth within the eurozone. But you have to say it's now, I would think, very vulnerable because it, it's owed a lot of money by the, the, the South, and it isn't at all clear to me that they can or will repay that money. So it was good, but they're probably going to get deprived of something down the road, number one. Number two, is I didn't talk at all about international competitiveness, Germany is an export powerhouse, and it's also happened to have been very well positioned for the big growth market, because it makes big ticket, high quality machine tools. I mean, lots of other things, consumer durables, cars and so on. But the Chinese absolutely adore that stuff. And the way the Chinese have come on as they have is they put the German stuff into their factories. They get Hong Kong management and, hey, presto, it all works. That's the way the, the economics work. And of course, if your own exchange rate, which would otherwise have been higher, has been depressed because the Eurozone has a whole lot of deficit countries, which is pulling it down, and we have the concerns of that, it will give your exporters to you know, China uh, uh, um, an excess advantage. And I'd say... Uh, lots of stuff, other stuff going on there because China's probably reduced its exchange rate below where it would be because it's been building up its reserves. So there's a kind of a whole lot of stuff going on and I just think in the great big world out there you just have to, you swing with the punches. Germany's had a good time with the ex ex external, external trade position. It's a bit better than it would have been had they been um, had they had the mark but it's so much worse what's happening in the Eurozone that if, uh, if I was German I would I would re rewrite the whole thing and say I'm sticking with the mark. They're bringing all this trouble on their heads and it isn't, it promise you, it isn't over yet. And there's so much more pain to come and the pain will be stuff that people just, they didn't even know it could happen, like Target 2. There'll be stuff that they didn't even, even, didn't even know could happen when it happens. So, solutions, what do you do? Well, the current policy requires only one of two things. One, inflation in Germany and no inflation in the South. Or two, no inflation in Germany and deflation in the South. What are we doing at the moment? The latter. Inflation in Germany and deflation in the South. It's the only way to get the South to be competitive. So are you going to go on holiday in Greece or... No, not you, you're all wealthy. Is the average, average Joe who lives in England or Germany or wherever going to go on holiday in Turkey or Greece on cost basis today? Turkey, every time. Flexible exchange rate, everyone says, actually, it's just as nice as Greece, just go to the other side of the Aegean, and everyone's all chirpy, they're doing stuff, it's all fine, and, you know, don't worry. Actually, the Germans don't go to Greece because the Greece are horrible. They are horrible to them. They are. In fact, a, a Dutch tourist was beaten up in some resort in Greece because they thought he was German, you know. <laughs> and, and this is what's happening, because there is a sort of, a sort of colonisation. You know, the fact is now that, you know, in the end, that Greece is on a lifeline, uh, which, which Germany has a pair of scissors and could snip any time, and it occasionally allows a bit of blood. But it's a pretty painful thing, painful position for both Germany and, and Greece to be in. So we're having the latter, we're having deflation in, in, in the south, but to have Greece properly competitive, and I'm using Greece because it's most extreme, but also Portugal, S Spain, Italy, it's not one or two or three percent real reduction in, in wages. It's 20, 30, 40, and in Greece, 60 percent reduction in wages in euro terms. I mean, well, what's the consequences of that? A uh, revolution, uh, complete kind of breakdown of law and order. In, in Greece, probably a military coup. Um, and it worsens your debt problem. So you're guaranteed to default because your debt's fixed in euros. 
So if you're becoming a smaller country in euros, which Greece is, which Spain is, which Italy is, your debt which is sticking up here will just get worse. So this is a really bad idea and I don't just mean sort of economic theory, I mean in moral and social terms what's going on and they are contracting today, last year, in real terms the contraction in Greece was 6% real in Ireland, sorry, in, in Italy and Spain, 1-2% to 2 real. I mean, this is really very serious. Um, so to me, it's a sledgehammer. And the big problem is that actually the decisions are micro-decisions. So the, the, the problem is trade, uh, you know, the austerity is all happening and that's just going to keep on going and the rest of it. But the big decisions are trade decisions. The fact is that Germany is an exporter net and that Italy is now actually a net importer, Spain is a net importer and all the other ones are net importers, but they're micro decisions, they're individual families who say well I buy my car in Sunderland, in Stuttgart or in, in, uh, in Seville and they buy it in Sunderland or Stuttgart for, for, for all the reasons that we've, that we've said. So it's very hard to change those micro decisions without changing prices because people will just behave, be behave rationally, they always will. So the only other way is to put in quantitative controls but then you lose your single, your single market. So all the all the levers that a normal country has to control its export position without just using price, you lose. In the Eurozone, you lose. So it's, it's to me, the current policies, although they suit the purposes of the Germans, particularly the Germans, I think, are, are impoverishing and freezing Europe in a worse than Japanese type environment for, as far as I can see, the permanent future. So. Um, are we going to get you know, what about departure? What happens with departures? Um, until a year ago, you just couldn't. If you walked into uh, a, a bar in Germany or France and said departures, you know, everyone would just land on you saying this is verboten. It's like saying, you know, that that, that one race is less intelligent than another. You just couldn't say it. And starting about the um, the beginning of 2012 with the Greek default. German politicians, particularly a couple of German MPs, started to say that we have to get rid of Greece, they're, they're no good. So the word departure became OK. And I mean, I thought hard about Greece because when I wrote the, year, the, the Wilson Essay Prize, which was a year ago, um, it seemed to be the most likely. And I studied the parallel it would have with Argentina, which had a fixed exchange rate with the dollar until, t until 2002, and did exactly the same things as Greece. It ran a huge trade deficit, a few, a few public... Uh, public um, sector deficit, the two matching the loss of aggregate demand and increase of aggregate demand, it could no longer fund it. The whole thing collapsed in default and disaster. The exchange rate went to a quarter of its old rate and from that point they had 6% real growth after inflation for the next nine years. They had a fabulous time and by the way they didn't re repay any of the, of, of the debt which they then could have because they had the money. They just said we're going to default anyway because it's a bad country, it's like Greece, it, it buys and cheats I'm afraid it does it consistently. Um, I have, uh, don't worry, it's not just me being, this isn't slanderous, I have evidence and, and lots of people have evidence, um, including some hedge fund managers who've got some old Argentinian debt which they didn't agree to accept the restructuring on and, and they've now got a court in New York to, um, uh, what's it called, sequester any Argentinian government money that comes in and out, in and out of New York. I mean, it's a, it's a hilarious sort of situation. Um, so, I, you know, if I was Greece, I'd leave. Absolutely. I'd just say, this is crazy. We, just, we can't live. We'll have the, uh, the old drachma, the old exchange rate. We went in at, at 350 per euro. It'll be 900 per euro. Uh, and then we'll have inflation. We're back to normal. Life will be as it was. And you can, you know, I was going to say a naughty word. You know, I don't care about the debt. You, you, you sort it out. And I'll be Argentina. I'll start again. Um, is it likely in the near term? I, I think from the centre, the centre will do everything it can to prevent that happening. And, and Cyprus, I mean, even, this is a tiny economy, the GDP of Cyprus is 17 billion euros. Uh, it's absolutely tiny. Um, but, you know, they've kind of half left already because they've got exchange controls on euros in Cyprus. And I bet you there's a guy in Cyprus who says, I'll exchange onshore and offshore euros at, at um, 80 cents on the euro. You know, so there's already an exchange rate, and maybe it's 60 cents, I don't know. Uh, so, so, so who knows? So is that a question? Or you, no, no, not, not that. Um, but I think much more likely is one of 
these countries that are under the cosh will just say I've had enough. And we thought it would be Greece in, in May, June. It wasn't. But there's a lot of other ones who are getting very, very close. Couldn't they do the same? And just get out? Who? Portugal? Yeah, yeah. They could well do. Yeah, but remember, I mean, typically, and I wrote in the Wilson Prize, I thought this would happen by a democratic process. So what happens is you have a sort of Nigel Farage type or a Le Pen type or something who says, vote for me, and, we'll, and we got, we, well, we had Grillo. He got 26% of the popular vote. And he said, vote for me, and we'll get out of the euro. So, I mean, that, he went from naught, and he's a comedian. That shows you the politics is happening. So, I mean, when you get a serious politician who says, vote for me, and I'll take you out of the euro, and he's get elected, there's nothing that Merkel or the Germans or anyone can do, because they're supposed to be democracies, and you're supposed to listen when, <laughs> when someone says, we believe in democracy. Um, so I'll just quickly do Cyprus. It's a very odd one, Cyprus. I mean, I didn't spot this at all, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Eurozone watcher. Um, it, it, it became an offshore banking centre for Russian money when, it, before it joined the Euro, which was 08, it joined the EU in 04. And the Russians could get access to EU and all the sort of things, the good things that that bought. And they typically wanted to get out of the hands of Putin, who would tend to kind of rape and pillage if he could, put their money where they thought it would be secure, in the Euro, and then they'd reinvest in, 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 in Russia. So actually, a lot of Russian companies are owned by, by Cypriot companies who have had their funding from Cypriot banks, which has come from Russia. So it's just a sort of circulation vehicle. Um, the problem is, Cypriot banks invested in Greek government debt, which is now worth you know, 20 cents on the dollar, so they lost a massive amount of money. They've now, Parliament has now, at first said, okay, we'll, we'll give all the depositors a haircut. So everyone under 100,000 euros will haircut you, you know, 9% and everyone over, it'll be 20% or something. And the Parliament voted it down. Well, of course they did, because they're going to deprive every depositor in, in, in Cyprus of 9%. No, 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 no. They can do it with only 2% of the depositors, which is everyone over 100,000 euros or whatever the number is, and keep their electors happy. So they said, no, we, we, we won't deprive anyone under $100,000. So it looks like of the two banks, Likey and Bank of Cyprus, Likey depositors over 100,000 uh, euros will lose all their money, the whole lot. Depositors, this isn't bondholders or shareholders, this is depositors. And with the Bank of, Bank of Cyprus, it's unclear, but probably 60 to 70% of their money. But the problem is, a lot of that money is back-to-back -back loans. So it's a Russian invests a uh, million dollars in Cyprus, and Cyprus lends the guy $900,000 euros. Excuse me. So if you deprive him of his million euros, he says, well, forget the 900,000 euros I owe you. So in the process of depriving the deposit, just uniquely in this banking system, you're probably also getting rid of your own assets. So the whole thing is a total bloody disaster. And honestly, at the moment, everyone's completely stuck. I don't know what to do. I mean, just, nobody knows what to do. And the Eurozone is saying, unless you pass this law and deprive the depositors, we won't even give you any emergency funding and the whole thing is kaput. So, I mean, watch this space. I, 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 that's middle of last week. I still didn't know what's happening because they're still voting and re-voting. It, it's horrible. It's so small you can obviously weather it, but it's a precedent. So, what do I think, longer term? So, can the Euro survive in its present form? And my view is, and I'm picking up the conversation we just had earlier, without... Proper political integration, and I mean one president, one parliament, no sovereignty at all in the member states, then it cannot survive. It cannot, for all the reasons I've told you, that we haven't got the mechanisms by which we can, in America it works, you move people, you know, you move capital, you move, you know, all the stuff, common regulatory, the guarantee from the state, ultimately, that, that just doesn't exist. And you don't have, the moment, the risk that you still have, have sovereignty, in theory, in these member states who can choose to leave. So... What do I think? How will that pan out? Sort of one to five years, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I wrote a paper in 1998 when I thought I said that the euro would dissolve in 2003. So you can see how, how bad I am at timing. Um, so, but currently my guess, one member state, one or more, may leave in the next one or two years. Not must. But, you know, to fix Cyprus, it's just got to be so much sticking plaster. It'll be all plaster and no person. Um, and... Honestly, until the euro, I, I mean, I don't think we should have single currencies. I think you should have a currency that matches your sovereignty. That's how it should and will. That's the only thing that, should, that works. Um, but you could plausibly have Holland, probably even Estonia, Finland and Germany as a currency. I just say, why? Why would you want to have, if you're Dutch, perfectly good country, why would I have the Germans run it? Don't, I wouldn't bother. Um, 
uh, but uh, you can't have Italy or France with Germany, and they're too big, or Spain. So it will, it will fail. It will fail with absolute certainty, and the only bit that I can't tell you is the timing. Now, you might say, it lasts 100 years, you're wrong, Mr. Record. Well, no, it, it you know, okay, in, rea in sort of what you might call, it, de facto, if it lasts 100 years, I'll be utterly amazed, but it will break up, it ultimately will break up. Um, this doesn't really apply to you, but you know, if you're an investor, you should, you, your capital should fly, because uniquely, it's free. So mostly when you have a, cu a country in trouble, let's say Spain or Italy, a seriously big country in trouble, moving your money out and putting it somewhere else is very costly. You, you, know, you have a weak exchange rate, you have to buy expenses. At the moment, you have a fixed exchange rate with Germany, and no difference in the interest rate. I mean, maybe half a percent. Close all your accounts in Italy, open them all in Frankfurt, and run your account with your credit card and your debit card from Frankfurt. Done. No risk. And everyone has done that, which is why all those balances have exploded. And there'll be more, you know, there is more to come. But I mean, you've got to do that. And this is for pension funds. I mean, hold, hold southern liabilities, northern assets, all this kind of stuff. And you can probably do a bit of hedging, intra, intra euro hedging as well. So, wrapping up, how are we doing on time? We're fine. Um, it feels okay at the moment f from the perspective of the UK and, you know, sort of wandering around Europe, apart from maybe in Greece. It is so not okay that we are covering up and covering up some very, very serious underlying problems and we have no solutions to fix them. Um, you know, it's giving low and zero growth rates, actually with the exception of the Netherlands and Germany, across the board. You know, I mentioned the bad ones, but France is having a horrible time. Italy's having a horrible time. Spain's that's horrendous. I mean, 27% youth unemployment in Spain. And, and just no prospects. So you'll start to see some really very serious things like you know, kind of the proper emigration we've had from Eastern Europe. You know, people will leave not, never wanting to return. You'll emasculate our proper country. This is a terrible thing to do. You should just... I can't believe they're doing it. Um, at the moment, we're in crisis containment. We have a pressure cooker. We're holding it all together. But the Wilson Prize is all about what happens if a little bit starts to crack and shh, you know, and, and uh, you know, I think when it blows, it could, it could blow, like one person could leave, and then a week later, there's a, you know, another guy says, I want to leave too, and it's like, whoa, and, it's, and then you have, believe me, trouble, because all the banks have all their, all their denomination, is all going to be wrong, all their assets will be in the weak countries and all their liabilities in the strong ones, for all the reasons that we've been talking about, and the one in the middle, is the ECB, which is going to be so bankrupt, it's scary. So we have departures. And then all the derivatives, they're all stateless. So every derivative in euro, and there are trillions of euros of derivatives, what state are they? How do you resolve them? And I cover all this in the Wolfson Prize. So if Merkel reads that and does what I say, <laughs> Europe, no, no, I'm absolutely serious. I promise you, they don't understand. I promise you. And Nordis Cameron, he's read my submission, he doesn't understand. Merkel doesn't understand. It's political for them. Oh, we have to keep it together. You know, this is our policy. But they don't understand what is happening. Yes? I, I understand the banks have already started doing... Yeah, a little bit of matching. They're a long way to go. And a lot of the stuff they don't really know about. That's the problem. And it depends on the regime. When, if there's a breakup between a couple of big countries, what's the regime? Is it the debtor currency applies? Or the creditor currency applies? They, they don't know the rules. There aren't any rules. So unless you have an unbelievably well-structured exit, read my Wilson, my Wilson, Wilson Pride essay, because that is it. But it's already a Merkel task force already produced the document locked away in a safe. So it's been thought about, we've got all the derivatives, so we know what we're doing, and we know how to get everyone else on board, easy, but read the document and you'll find out how. But I promise you, no one's taking it seriously, but you really need to do this. Um, what and, uh, you know, the Sorry? He said it's all fine, you can have one leave, it'll be nasty. This is Roger Bootle, the winner. He's a fine man, I like him a lot. We had a, a lunch afterwards and he was patted me on the shoulders and said, never mind Neil, next, the better luck's time. But he's wrong, in my opinion, of course that's it, in my opinion, he thinks you can have one leave and it'll all be okay and the rest will all pull together. I just don't think that's going to happen. If your scenario is right, quite, quite possibly in my opinion, how drastically, I mean, will it, do you think it will affect the economic view? Oh, oh. I mean, I, I, I well, it's a bit like saying a nuclear bomb goes off in Paris, how will it affect the UK? Uh, the direct explosion, not that much, but the fallout, horrendous. 
I mean, this is leading, in my opinion, because of the blindness and the political nature of this project, it's leading to a really serious crisis which will make the credit crunch, 2008, look like the warm-up act. Yes, one at the back, not yeah. the one. John yeah. at the back. That was masterly, and I very much agree with, with that whole expose, which was very good. A uh, couple of quick comments. Uh, you, you alluded to France quite a bit towards the end, and, and, and I think the French situation has been underplayed and, and, and not, not understood too much. It may well be that the next big problem comes from France, interestingly. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's some really interesting... I, I mean, I think... I mean, clearly, you can certainly let Greece go and say it's of no consequence, 1% of the Eurozone GDP, who cares? But France is enormous, exactly. Germany can't afford its debts, exactly. it's heavily indebted, and it has a dysfunctional political class that believes you can spend your way out of exactly. the, the problem. Okay, second comment. Um, I think it all depends on, on Germany's willingness to keep funding the rest of Europe. Correct. And, and it has strong... It, it, except for this awkward business of democracy. Well, the Nigel yeah, Farages uh, of this world who come and upset the whole thing. Um, uh, and, 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 and there are strong reasons for Germany to want to keep the whole game, yep. the game going. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and what has happened that each time we've reached a crisis point, uh, Merkel has blinked and, and, and agreed to carry on with yep. the game, most recently in assenting to drag it yep. uh, take, yep. do what it takes Correct. to comment. And, and, and so far, she's proved electorally co correct. Yep. Mutti yep. has had the right idea. Yep. And I believe that they'll carry on blinking. I do too. And, and I was discussing this with Heinz over there at lunch, and we were talking exactly about what you'd be making. Uh, and and I, I, I think, you know, I think Warfield plays a lot because Germany doesn't want to be seen as the bad guys of Europe. No. And they'll keep on blinking. Yeah. And so there could be an argument that this whole shell game, find the lady situation goes on for quite a long time until Germany's treasure, very large treasure, is exhausted. And that could be five, seven years. Keep going, keep going. <coughs> 10, 20, 30 years of Japan. But not Japan for Germany, Japan for everybody else. But, well, so they I get the... It could be that long, but, but certainly it could go on with, with Germany blinking each time, both electorally and among its... I leaders. agree. Um, uh, for whatever reason, which is crazy, because it's impoverishing them and probably impoverishing Europe until they sort all of this out. Uh, but, 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 it, but, it, but it could hold together for yeah. much longer. No, I, I agree. And I have to agree, because I thought it couldn't possibly stay together. This is so illogical, but it has got this far. So I, clearly, I wasn't understanding the power of, of, of the European project, as Merkel would call it, which is absolutely fundamental to their foreign policy. So it is very deep, this. Yes, last question. I'm just following what if, if, if it does uh, implode, what will happen to the UK currency and what will happen to UK inflation? Uh, UK currency, don't know. I mean, you know, it's sort of caught in the, in the, in the crossfire. I mean, it, hard to say. Probably strengthened just because it, it's a state that people understand. You know, a bit like that we can sell gilts at one, two, well, a negative real because it's a sort of a, a place people understand. Um, what was the other question? Uh, currency. Okay. Inflation. It depends whether you think that the euro departure would mean inflation in Northern Europe. I'm not sure. Honestly, I, I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. In fact, at the, right at the end of the Wilson Prize, one of the reasons I didn't win is I didn't write out what was going to happen in the future. I said, well, hold that. Hold on, I want to go back to market and I'll let the market decide. So I, I don't really know. So I, I just think we just get back to having, having prices and a, a dynamic adjustment process and then we'll see what we see. Interest rates, you wouldn't like to have the guess about. Je sais quoi. Thank you very much.